Hi there, I'm Paula Jamison. We're coming from Public Media Network in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I'm pleased to host a conversation today with Bill Corson, who is the dean of the uh, BVI School of Ayurveda here in Kalamazoo. And this is an important resource in our community. Ayurveda brings a holistic approach to health and healing and is offering courses and consultations in this community. We're going to talk today about a subject I think that is of interest to almost every person on this planet, pain and how pain is managed and how it's looked at. So today, um, Bill, we're going to pick your brain a little bit about how, you, how Ayurveda and Ayurvedic practitioners look at the treatment of pain. Welcome. It's, it's my pleasure and thank you so much for having me here. It's a pure delight. Could you start us off by just giving a little thumbnail description of Ayurveda? Surely, I'd be happy to. I like to call Ayurveda yoga sister science mm -hmm. because its provenance is from ancient India. It grew up in ancient India at the same time as yoga, and it shares a number of fundamental assumptions with yoga. It shares a philosophic basis with yoga. The word Ayurveda is from the Sanskrit, and it means exactly what the word biology means, the science of life. Mm -hmm. But in context, we take it to mean the science of longevity or the science of how one might promote life, mm -hmm. promote the length of life. Um, it is a holistic system of medicine in that its uh, protocols for treatment are highly individualized to the specific client. Um, Ayurveda is holistic in that its means are natural. It uses modalities such as exercise, diet, uh, physical modalities such as light, air, heat, and cold, mm -hmm. massage and manipulative therapies, herbal medicine as its, as its therapeutic armament okay. in dealing with a, um, a wide variety of, of uh, not only human complaints but animal complaints as uh -huh. well. Uh -huh of both the physical and psychological character. Uh, probably the most unique thing about Ayurveda is its regard for the uniqueness of the individual client. Um, in Ayurvedic theory, there are certain psychobiological types uh, that, that are preponderant in, in the population, and the uh, types, we call them doshas. The types are um, readily discernible. Uh, we can look at an individual's appearance and conduct, um, their uh, proclivities and aversions, and arri arrive at an estimation of what their type is. And on that basis, can make recommendations for the maintenance of, of an optimal level of health or for the restoration of health where it is lacking. Well, and even the way you're describing these types uh, indicates the holistic nature of what you're talking about because you're not yes. just talking about the physical. No. You're talking about habits of mind in a way it sounds like, Indeed, too. yes. Ayurveda does not draw a distinction. Indeed, it states that it is impossible to, to draw a, a line of demarcation between the body, mm -hmm. the mind that it houses, and the spirit that animates both the body and mind. Mm -hmm. We say that biological events can evoke psychological consequences. Psychological events can evoke biological consequences. Mm -hmm. So we deal with each client as a unity. Which is both extremely complex sounding to mm. us Westerners, mm. I think, who are used to a different kind of medical system, mm -hmm. but also feels very intuitive on some other levels. It, it is very intuitive. It is very intuitive. Complex, I don't know that I would necessarily say that Ayurveda is complex. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is complex in the sense that it has a vast written canon. Uh -huh. There is a vast amount of information that Ayurveda has acquired, and it's the job of the practitioner to be acquainted with that, mm -hmm. with that canon. In terms of its, its clinical applications, if one under, has a sound understanding of fundamental principles, mm -hmm. It's not that difficult to apply in, in practice. Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. 
Well, we're here to talk about pain and, and mm -hmm. pain, the, the phrase is used a lot now, pain management yes, in, yes. in the West. Could you tell us a little bit uh, just about our understanding of the prevalence of pain in today's world? Well, it is extremely prevalent. It is estimated that in excess of a third of the population at some point uh, over, over the lifetime experiences serious chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Serious in, in the, severe in its intensity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and chronic in that it lasts for six months or more. And many individuals experience much long la longer lasting pain or pain mm -hmm. that repeats itself uh, in, in, um, in, in, in bouts of intense suffering uh, mm -hmm. intermittent with subsidence. Um, it is becoming more prevalent among younger people. Mm. Pain is no longer confined to the to the older population. It's it's pretty much a phenomenon that is seen across the board age wise. And is this is there an understanding of why? Is it just people are reporting pain now? Or? It may have to do with the fact that people are reporting pain more readily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That there's less value f to be found in suffering in silence mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. hoping that it will go away. Yeah. And a more a more um, a more um, proactive attitude in, in, in pursuing its cessation. About n the estimates are between eighty to ninety percent of individuals who can who consult a healthcare provider, whether that healthcare provider is a conventional physician mm -hmm. or a practitioner of Ayurveda or of some other uh, lineage of alternative medicine is about 80 to 90 percent wow. owing mm -hmm. to owing to the problem of pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as we get into our conversation, I think we'll allude to this more often, mm -hmm. but the program for which you're teaching at the School of Ayurveda here um, offers courses? Do you offer treatments or consultations? Yes, in indeed we do. The, uh -huh. the uh, School of Ayurveda, it's the Bodhananda Vedic Institute, or mm -hmm. BVI, School of Ayurveda in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, does offer uh, um, coursework intended to prepare individuals who wish to become Ayurvedic practitioner, mm -hmm. as well as offering standalone courses for individuals who are interested in using Ayurveda for some specific end. Mm -hmm. um, it does offer consultations with, with uh, visiting clinicians and members of the faculty uh -huh. mm -hmm. as they're available. And what kinds of people tend to become students in the program? I could imagine some healthcare practitioners being Well, interested. yes. Mm, healthcare practitioners who have become aware of Ayurveda's safety and efficacy mm -hmm. and want to further their own knowledge of it. Nutritionists, physiotherapists, chiropractors, physicians, nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. acupuncturists, um, the, the programs that I teach in both here and, and abroad are, are um, well populated by such individuals. Uh, yoga teachers, there's, mm. a, there's a great uh, migration of, yo not migration, but a great movement of yoga teachers mm -hmm. who wish to amplify their value to their, to their clientele. Mm -hmm. um, you also have a great number of people with no background in health care who have learned something about Ayurveda, who appreciate its usefulness and who want to assume a larger measure of responsibility in caring for their own health and their, the health of their families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it sounds like on that level, mm -hmm. too, that people who are seeking um, a greater, perhaps they're not even looking to treat a certain condition, but they're looking to support the quality of their health overall? Yes, mm -hmm. that is often the case. Uh -huh. You do see individuals <clears throat> who know what Ayurveda has to offer in terms mm -hmm. of individualized health care or health, health maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, you have individuals who have been given a diagnosis uh -huh. by a Western medical practitioner and who, armed with that diagnosis, seek to implement Ayurvedic strategies okay. in its treatment mm -hmm. um, without, without using Western medicine. You have individuals who have um, been given a diagnosis and who have experienced a Western therapeutic protocols 
but are left unsatisfied, mm -hmm. either because the protocol was ineffective or because the side effects and adverse events accompanying treatment were unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, you do have a few others who present uh, rather unique symptomatologies mm -hmm. uh, for which Western medicine has no diagnosis. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And for that reason are, are, are utilizing Ayurveda as their primary uh, approach to mm -hmm. treating the problem. Mm -hmm. So a very wide range of individuals. A very wide range of individuals, yes. yes. Yeah, this is fascinating. Mm. And relatively, I mean, certainly this is an ancient, ancient mm -hmm. system, but mm. certainly relatively new to this part of the Midwest. It's, it is new to, it is new to uh, the United States. Um, I think Americans first became aware of Ayurveda with uh, the wave of Indian immigration that mm -hmm. occurred at the end of the 1970s, the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, unlike its sister science, yoga, which has been present uh, in this country since the end of the 19th century, mm -hmm. Ayurveda is a, is, is a fairly novel introduction. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of public awareness of what Ayurveda is and what it can do, mm -hmm. It's just standing on a threshold now mm -hmm. when it's beginning to be recognized. In terms of the public consciousness, I would say that Ayurveda is probably about where acupuncture and Chinese medicine were in the year 1973 or 1974. Mm -hmm. But we're making up that mm -hmm. very quick. We're making up that gap very quickly. What an exciting time for you it and for the an school, too. It is an incredibly exciting time. Yeah, this is quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about maybe some background information. I'm thinking maybe the, without going into too much detail, mm -hmm. but some of the philosophical underpinnings behind Ayurveda and the way well, you look at it's your... It's a fascinating story. Uh -huh. And I like to say that it's very easy to talk about Ayurveda for 20 or 30 hours and very difficult to talk about Ayurveda for an hour. I like the hard but, question. <laughs> but but by, by way of, of summary, Ayurveda evolved in ancient India. Ayurveda came into existence five, six, seven thousand years ago, um, well before urban settlements existed, mm -hmm. well before settled agriculture existed, when alphabets were newfangled things. It is, it is as old as, as humankind falling subject to illness or injury, looking around in its environment for some means by which that illness or injury mm -hmm. might be addressed and, and applying that. Mm -hmm. um, Ayurveda is, uh, well, just like anything coming from ancient India, there's not a great deal of, of written canon that accompanies it in its earliest stages. Indeed, its written canon was not produced until very, very late in Ayurveda's mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. So it was a body of teachings transmitted from the teacher's mouth to the student's ear mm -hmm. for many thousands of years. The canon of Ayurveda did not begin to become reduced to writing until about the years, well, depending on what scholar you listen to, 800 to 1000 BC, wow. which yes. is quite late in its history uh -huh. indeed. Uh -huh. um, the ancients who elaborated Ayurveda didn't have means of laboratory investigation, analytic instrumentation mm -hmm. did not exist. Mm -hmm. So these ancients had only to rely on their senses, mm -hmm. their extremely acute powers of observation, and their powers of logical deduction and induction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, on the basis of what they could see, hear, taste, smell, and feel, and on the basis of what they could deduce from their sensory experiences, mm -hmm. they elaborated quite a complete and quite a scientific body of, of medical theory and practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Ayurveda is called a constitutional system of medicine. And I'll just touch briefly on that because that is Ayurveda's most distinctive feature. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ayurveda teaches that each of us is a unique individual and that within each individual there is a, an ongoing symphony, an ongoing concert uh -huh. between three biophysical forces, 
the force of anabolism or tissue building, mm -hmm. which we in Sanskrit call kapadosha, mm -hmm. the force of digestion by means of which nutrients from outside the body, very complex macromolecules, are reduced in complexity to something more easily utilizable by the body in either expending energy or building tissue. Mm -hmm. okay? So we have anabolism, catabolism, mm -hmm. and the third uh, of the forces, which is the, the co collectivity of biological forces responsible for movement or transportation mm -hmm. or communication mm -hmm. within the body, whether that movement is the coursing of blood and plasma through the circulatory system, the moving of lymphatic through and through the system of lymphatic drainage, um, the inhalation and exhalation phases of respiration, the voluntary or involuntary movement of the mm -hmm. various types of muscle tissue, the transmission of neural impulses along their nerve conduits, wherever there is movement, this particular biological force is in place. And we call these forces doshas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we give these doshas names for the force of anabolism or tissue building. We denominate that kapha dosha. For the force of, ana of catabolism or digestion, we know that as pita dosha. And for the collection of communicative and transportative functions within the organism, we have a name vata dosha. So, Although each one of those doshas is present in each individual all the time in every cell of every tissue, the proportional presence varies from individual to individual. One individual may have a surfeit of vata dosha, one individual may have a surfeit of kapha or pita dosha. Mm -hmm. And it's all very interesting, but what is its practical use? Well, its practical use is that if you know an individual's doshic signature, if you know the proportionality of one dosha to another, you know what they need to do to remain healthy mm -hmm. in terms of diet, lifestyle, fitness protocols. Mm -hmm. And the three have very differing needs. Mm -hmm. okay. You know what their vulnerabilities are you know what kind of health challenges are likely to assail these individuals and when they're likely to assert themselves. Uh -huh. And you know uh, what means, what steps need to be taken in order to maintain or restore the health of, of these individuals based on their doshic signature, based on their unique individual constitution. And in the context of this, which sounds like this really um, elaborate again, you said symphony of um, interactions and, and <clears throat> the way you describe these things, it's, it sounds like they're process, they re can refer to processes as well as to qualities, is that correct? I mean, when you talk about something that builds something up. That's and exactly right. We're okay. describing what the doshas are. But as you become familiar with Ayurveda, sooner or later you will confront yourself with the question, what's my dosha, mm -hmm. meaning, mm -hmm. meaning what is my doshic signature? Uh -huh. How do the doshas relate to one another? Am I principally a kappa, pita, or a vada? Uh -huh. Is there a secondary dosha? Is there a tertiary dosha? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the question not only is a, is a word that we use to signify bodily processes, mm -hmm. but also the type of individual in which these processes assert themselves in a particular way. Because again, yeah. different doshic types have different yes. needs. Yes, okay. and different descriptors. If uh -huh. I know that you're a kappa dosha, I know quite a bit about you. I know uh -huh. what your um, proclivities and aversions are. Uh -huh. I know some of the things about your habituations of thought. Uh -huh. um, I know some of, the, some of the things that you might encounter in the way of health challenges. Mm -hmm. So if you know an individual's dosha, you have some really valuable information mm -hmm. about them. Well, let's kind of hold that thought and come back to the uh, issue of pain. And mm -hmm. um, I, 
Could you say a little bit first before we talk about the understanding of pain maybe in Ayurveda, but talk a little bit about how we understand pain in the Western world uh, from a medical and treatment perspective? Certainly, from a medical, per from a Western biomedical mm -hmm, perspective, mm -hmm. pain is a dysregulation of neural impulses, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. brought about by tissue injury. If there is an injury to tissue, pain will be the likely result, assuming mm -hmm. the tissue that is injured is enervated, assuming mm -hmm. that nerves are where Present. the injury occurs. Uh -huh. and, and unless it happens to your hair, your nails, or your tooth enamel, most likely you're going to feel pain, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So assuming that the tissue is enervated and it is injured, pain in its most general definition is an unpleasant physiological and psychological experience to tissue injury. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. And we're we could extend the metaphor to sort of psychological pain as well, but for the moment, let's stay with the physical. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking too in the West, my experience has been that if you are a person experiencing pain, it's, it is considered a subjective state in that you can't look at me and tell me how much pain I'm experiencing. Indeed, no. And that we have in the West developed a very crude scale yes. for having people describe their pain, Indeed, yes. which is this scale of one to ten and yes. where you are. And if you're in the hospital, there are little frowning to smiley faces exactly along the right. line, and you're supposed to point at the one that reflects where you are. Yes. Um, can you say a little bit about what Ayurveda would bring to that conversation? Is there a broader, more nuanced understanding of how people experience pain? Yes, there is. It is, it is. Firstly, Ayurveda's um, scaling of the pain experience is indeed based on its intensity. Mm -hmm. Is it mild? Is it moderate? Or is it severe? Mm -hmm. And there are, there are various, various um, definitions of each. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in the, in the intensity of pain, but we're also interested in the quality of pain. Say more about that. Because pain, and Ayurveda acknowledges pain, it results from a disruption of neural transmission. We say that there is an impeded flow or a disordered flow of, of input into the nervous system, mm -hmm. and that results from injury to tissue, okay? Uh -huh. or, or if not injury, some other pathological process, inflammation, induration, whatever mm -hmm. it happens to mm -hmm. be. Um, we look at the quality of pain. Is the pain a burning pain? Mm -hmm. Is the pain a cutting pain? Is the pain a dull ache? Does the pain pulsate or is it steady? Mm -hmm. Does the pain move from one locale to another? Mm -hmm. So based on a concatenation of those factors, we devise a treatment strategy. Now it needs to be said that pain is not a disease. Pain is a sign mm -hmm. or symptom mm -hmm. of a disease. Pain does not exist in a vacuum. It is not, it is not a diagnosis and, uh, and it's nothing more than a sign or symptom. It means something. It means something. Uh -huh. So our ultimate aim is going to be to ascertain and eradicate the cause of the pain. Mm -hmm. However, until such time as that information is known to the practitioner, there's no reason not to treat the pain. Mm -hmm. Some symptoms are burden or d burdensome or dangerous in themselves. Mm -hmm. For example, pain, fever, hemorrhaging, bleeding, mm -hmm. these are all only symptoms. Yes. But they're symptoms that deserve to be addressed as quickly as possible. So pain is something that we want to, want to deal with um, coincident with our treatment of the underlying problem. If you come to me and you tell me that you're suffering from the pain of rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. yes, I will certainly suggest something for you that will quell that pain. Mm -hmm. But the mere fact that we're quelling the pain does not mean that we're dealing with the underlying autoimmune or inflammatory processes that are unfolding that cause pain in the first place. Uh -huh. So we have to deal with that as okay. well. So it really is a step <clears throat> past just 
um, and just, but the level of relieving the pain, uh, treating only the symptom. You really try to work behind the symptom and find what is causing the problem and addressing that. If you don't treat the underlying cause and you treat the symptom, sooner or later the underlying cause will assert itself in some different set of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, the two have to be done coincidentally or, or have to be done synchronously, I should mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it is uh, something that, as is the case with, with every treatment protocol in Ayurveda, is a highly individualized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. process. And, and looking at not just the nature of the injury or the suspected culprit for the pain, mm -hmm. but again, looking at that um, sort of doshic p portrait of what exactly. the person is bringing. Exactly. Thus it is that I may have two clients mm -hmm. with the same symptoms evincing the same kind of pain, who, but will not be treated identically owing to their constitutional signature. Mm -hmm. Ayurveda does not treat the disease alone. Mm -hmm. Ayurveda treats disease only in the context of the person suffering from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's talk maybe a little bit about how pain is conventionally treated. First, maybe a little bit about how we do it typically conventionally in the West, and then maybe some of the principles in Ayurveda that you bring to treating pain? The treatment of pain in Western medicine is principally confined to the use of analgesics, mm -hmm. drugs that will interrupt uh, the, the, the nervous uh, uh, flow, the nerve transmission, in such a way that the pain switch is turned from on to off. Mm -hmm. um, it can be treated either through the use of a central analgesic, which does that in the brain, or through the use of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent, mm -hmm. which will control the pain by uh, cooling whatever peripheral inflammation mm -hmm. or other injury or, or, or process of injury has given rise to it. And the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are things like ibuprofen, and a lot of them are over-the-counter. Ibuprofen, uh, naproxen mm -hmm. sodium, are, are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that are used for, for pains that control pain by down-regulating inflammation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Acetaminophen controls pain through acting directly on the brain. It is mm -hmm. not an anti-inflammatory. Right, right. And um, these can be very effective. However, they are accompanied by side effects. Mm -hmm. um, ibuprofen is estimated to cause about a thousand deaths a year mm -hmm. from liver failure and you're talking about what is regarded as a very innocuous mm -hmm. over-the-counter drug. Mm -hmm. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, are extremely hard on the gastric mucosa, the stomach lining, mm -hmm. and, and um, have been known to promote gastritis, ulcers, and bleeding from the stomach. So these are not without their cost. And it's, I think there's an important lesson reminder that it bears mentioning here, too, because these have become so prevalent in our lives oh, yes. that it's very easy for people to think of them as being very innocuous mm -hmm. and overusing them or using them kind of mindlessly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's a good lesson is to realize these are very powerful agents. And Indeed they are. they don't just stop the pain, they're acting on other parts of the body as That's well. That's exactly right. The metabolism is like a house of cards. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to build a house of cards, you know if you move one card, everything else might be affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're, they certainly deserve a great deal of respect. Mm -hmm. And um, how about uh, I'm thinking, for recently, for example, mm -hmm. I visited a physical therapist mm -hmm. because I was developing bursitis in my shoulder. Yes. So uh, there are ways in the West that we also look at um, physical kind of modalities to treat pain oh, yes. as well. Oh, yes. And, uh, and Ayurveda makes use of those modalities as well, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. we call physiotherapeutic or, or material modalities such as heat. Mm -hmm cold, mm -hmm. circulating water or hydrotherapy, mm -hmm. 
manipulation, massage, and other forms of body work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, an Ayurvedic equivalent of pressure point ah, or trigger okay. point therapy that we call marma therapy. Okay. Um, so yes, certainly the application of medicated oils and poultices, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are standard um, approaches to pain in Ayurveda, as well as dietary control, as well as, and perhaps I should say, especially herbal and herbal metallic medication. Oh, okay. Well, and let's, let's talk about those for a second, because mm -hmm. from what I've read, Ayurveda brings a very specialized kind of pharmacopoeia. Indeed it from does. From the world of herbs in, and metals. In, yes. Indeed it does, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, there are a number of Ayurvedic herbal medicines that are used for pain generally and for various types of pain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And could you, I mean, it's probably overkill to talk about them in detail, particularly because many of their names are quite foreign to us, but mm -hmm. can you talk about some of maybe the, the primary um, medicines that end up being used for pain? Surely, I'd be happy to. Many of them, many of them are commonly encountered culinary household spices mm. that you have in every kitchen. Peppermint, spearmint, turmeric, cayenne, mm -hmm. um, oregano, black pepper. These are commonly encountered, turmeric I think I mentioned. These are commonly encountered kitchen spices that you certainly can use to attenuate pain. Um, commonly en encountered household substances like castor oil. Mm -hmm. Castor oil is an absolutely miraculous topical treatment mm -hmm. for muscular pain, and I'll mention more about that as we proceed in the conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, there is one Ayurvedic herb, which I'm going to mention. It probably is not quite yet a household name, but is well on its way to becoming one. Uh -huh. And that is Ayurveda's most revered and most widely used of herbal medicines. It's called ashwagandha. Have you heard of ashwagandha? I have heard of it, but it's hardly a household word. Well, it's getting there. <laughs> it's getting there. It is actually the winter cherry bush, uh -huh. and it is um, it has a wide number of uses in Ayurveda, uh -huh. but uh, among its predominant uses are uh, is that of an analgesic. It is a powerful pain controlling um, medication for musculoskeletal and neuromuscular and joint pain. And what part of the plant is used? The root. The root, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a little different from what we know in the West of the origins of aspirin from willow bark. You know, it's not true. That's a widely it's a myth, believed myth. It uh -huh. doesn't come from willow bark. Uh -huh. It comes from um, another, uh, the reason that it was thought willow bark uh. is, willow bark is very, very rich in silicic mm -hmm. acid. In fact, salix is the Latin name of the willow tree. Mm -hmm, right. In fact, aspirin was derived from an unrelated herb called meadowsweet. Isn't that interesting? And yes, although uh -huh. it, is, it is a Western herb, it is not an Ayurvedic herb, mm -hmm. I do use meadowsweet extensively in my practice, for it is the only non-steroidal anti-inflammatory of plant origin hmm. that does not have an, um, an injurious effect on the stomach lining. It will, it will treat peripheral inflammations without adversely affecting the stomach lining and is in fact used to treat stomach inflammations like gastritis and gastroenteritis. Uh -huh. Well, and that raises an interesting question too because the herbs and substances that have evolved in Ayurveda certainly come from the Indian subcontinent, right? Or, or the Indian subcontinent or the Indian subcontinent and other areas. And, yeah. Right. But <clears throat> it's these would not traditionally have been necessarily plants from the Americas or from even, you know, Western Europe. So That's correct. So there are probably other things out there. I just I'm asking I'm making a statement that's a question, but are there then other herbal substances oh, in the many, wider world that many, are being adopted by practitioners now? Ma many of them, many mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite possible to use any Ayurvedic herb in a non-Ayurvedic way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in Ayurveda we use a specific system of herbal energetics, mm -hmm. 
viewed in, in tandem with the energetics or doshic signature of the individual patient we have uh -huh. a client we ask um, what is the plant's taste it does it have a heating or cooling energy does it have a trophism for a particular area of the body uh -huh. for a particular organ tissue or locale uh -huh. um, does it have Ayurveda without getting too without putting too fine a point on it has a notion that it calls vipaka or post digestive taste six to eight hours after you've taken the herb it changes its character hmm. what does it do when it changes its character uh -huh. so we have a system of energetics that we use our herbal stock in accordance with but you don't have to use ashwagandha in that fashion to mm -hmm. derive its analgesic effects mm -hmm. If you do, you're not using it in an optimal fashion, but you can do it. And you will S still get benefits. And you'll still get benefits. Similarly, uh -huh. you can use a non-Ayurvedic herb in accordance with Ayurvedic energetics. Mm -hmm. If you come to me with a particular problem, mm -hmm. I can take an herb, a non-Ayurvedic herb like Golden Seal, mm -hmm. and give it to you in an enormous quantity. Let's say you have a bacterial infection. Uh -huh. I can give it to you in an enormous quantity that is absolutely going to smother the bacteria. It's going to eradicate it. Uh -huh. That's using it in a non-Ayurvedic way. Mm -hmm. I could give it to you in a, in a different dosage form, in a different dosage that would alter the tissue terrain so mm -hmm. as to make your body a less receptive host mm -hmm. to that bacterial mm -hmm. infection. Mm -hmm. That's using it in an Ayurvedic uh -huh, way. Uh -huh. So um, you know, Ayurvedic herbs are not the cultural property of an isolated ethnic enclave. Mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds as if um, what you're really saying there, too, is that it's not the herbs in and of themselves. It's the way the herbs are being utilized and, yes. and perceived, too, in, in their interaction with this larger body, mind, spirit. That is exactly the case. So, that yes. is exactly the case, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. Which is a very, I think in a lot of ways, um, encouraging way for a lot of us who have had struggles when we've had various mm -hmm. kinds of connections with our, our Western healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Uh, to understand that there are other ways of looking at these things that have In, effective indeed outcomes. Indeed there are. Indeed mm -hmm. there are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Ayurveda has, an, has a number of, of substances and protocols mm -hmm. that it uses in addressing pains of various types. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and let's talk about some of the types of pain and the kinds of things that might be brought to relieve them. Well, pain is invariably mediated by neural dysregulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we say it is, it is brought about by, to use Ayurvedic parlance with you, a disrupted vata dosha. That something, transportation communication yes, part. Yes, something has become dysregulated, mm -hmm. giving rise to pain. Mm -hmm. So we need to treat it as a dysregulation of the force known as vata in the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. We can use mechanical means such as heat, cold, manipulation, mm -hmm. and so on. We can use nutritional means such as, for example, placing an individual on an anti-inflammatory, on an inflammation controlling diet. Mm -hmm and uh, giving the individual specific herbs to consume dependent on the character of the pain and the individual's doshic signature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are, um, I'm going to say at least 30 or 40 herbs whose uh -huh. names would be meaningless, right? but um, some of them are, are in every kitchen. Uh -huh. And we'll detail those if you wish. Uh -huh. Well, actually, I'd like to talk about that because that might be kind of an interesting takeaway for our audience at large. Certainly. What kinds of things um, in, in most people's kitchens mm -hmm. might be supportive, not necessarily in, in the Western sense of, well, I have a, I have a sore thumb, I'm going to take this herb, but um, what might support that, um, you know, dim overall diminishment of Okay, of specific pain. herbs that are in everyone's kitchen would include turmeric. Mm -hmm. 
the yellow um, and curry powder. The yellow, the yellow and curry powder. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, we know it as haldi or haridra. Mm -hmm. It is curcumin longum, mm -hmm. and it is an extremely powerful analgesic. Mm -hmm. it, it is an anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. It is an antioxidant, and there are very few instances of pain in which it cannot be satisfactorily employed. Mm -hmm. And of course, you could further extend by increasing the amount of turmeric that you cook with, but to achieve a therapeutic dose, one would ordinarily want to purchase uh, turmeric capsules, uh -huh. which, which embodied a medicinal dose. Mm -hmm. Because that would be an awful lot of curry otherwise, wouldn't it? It could For be. most it, people. It, it could be the kind of taste sensation that you don't want. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, another powerful analgesic is oregano, not mm -hmm. an herb particularly widely used in Ayurveda, not nearly as widely used as it should be, mm -hmm. because it is a powerful analgesic and antioxidant that actually promotes healing. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, black pepper does just about the same. Mm -hmm. um, marjoram does just about the same. Ginger is an interesting herb. Ginger is a powerful analgesic, and it falls into that category of herbs that in Ayurveda we call Rajaushadi, kings of medicine, mm, mm -hmm. because of their extremely wide range of okay. applicability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we were Westerners, we'd say it's a very broad spectrum. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it can be used to treat inflammatory pain, the pain associated with edema or swelling mm -hmm. or, or displacement. It can be used for, for nearly any kind of, of pain that you'll encounter. Topically, the use of the capsaicin that is the active therapeutic mm -hmm. agent in cayenne pepper or in its lack, cayenne pepper itself mm -hmm. can be very useful. And that's one of those substances that we've read more and more about too. And, and you can buy creams now with the pepper in it that are a topical for analgesic you, creams. You for can example. indeed. Yes. Peppermint and spearmint, in fact, just about all of the mint family mm -hmm. fall into this category as well. I think mm -hmm. peppermint is probably the most, has the most pointed analgesic mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. um, there are others, but they're a little bit outside of the purview of a Western mm -hmm. kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, Ashok Saraka Indica is not a commonly encountered Western herb, mm -hmm. yet in, in the treatment of any kind of abdominal pain, but most especially the pain of severe menstrual cramping, mm. it is amazingly effective and very yeah. quickly effective. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, topical treatments include a wide array of medicated oils. Mm -hmm. Um, most of them unfamiliar to Westerners. Mm -hmm. One that will be familiar to Westerners is castor oil, uh -huh. which is often used in this country as a laxative or purgative. Mm -hmm. However, uh, warmed and used as a topical poultice mm -hmm. um, on, on sore joints or, or mm -hmm. sore, uh, sore bony structures mm -hmm. is an absolutely excellent analgesic and very fast acting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was one I think Edgar Case was kind of behind promoting uh, in Edgar Edgar Case uh, years uh, and uh, years uh, ago. Yeah, yeah. Edgar, Edgar Case. Um, I don't know that Edgar Case had any knowledge whatsoever of Ayurveda uh -huh. or even used the word. Mm -hmm. But it is noteworthy that many of his medical uh, of his medical readings pointed precisely in the direction of Ayurveda. Isn't that fascinating? Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. he's, he had a lot to say that um, I don't think has been fully um, investigated. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Although I'm given to understand that there is now uh, an institute that has been established to further serious research into mm -hmm. his medical readings called the Meridian Institute in Virginia Beach, uh -huh. Virginia. Wow. Yeah, Edgar Casey had quite a lot to say and mm -hmm. uh, much of it still mm -hmm. awaits, awaits serious study. Well, and along those lines, it's really interesting that Western <coughs> researchers are 
uh, delving into some of the substances that probably were thought of as folk medicines because they were commonly available, like the mint family and ginger and things like that. And all of a Surely. sudden, they're looking at it in a sort of a biomedical, biochemical way. Surely. Necessity is the mother of invention, uh -huh. and uh -huh. human beings are very inventive. Mm -hmm. And it's always interesting to me when you have this accumulated body of traditional knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that consists of large numbers of people over a vast extent of territory, sometimes in, uh, seen in mutually isolated mm -hmm. ethnic enclaves, mm -hmm. over vast periods of time using exactly the same herb or very similar herbs mm -hmm. for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. In Ayurveda, we conceive of that as being a legitimate source of, of data. We call it traditional knowledge or TK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where you have, where you have centuries, if not millennia, attesting to the efficacy of a particular herb, mm -hmm. notwithstanding what it may say on, on, the, on, the, on the WebMD website, uh -huh. deserves further study. Well, five or 6,000 years of study is quite a lot. It's quite a lot, That, yes. to one's thinking, is, is uh -huh. sufficient evidence of, of right. effectiveness. Oh, but it, in a way, it's like translating from one language to another. It really is, yes. Because, and, and, and the whole cultural overlays for these different systems, too. I mean, yes, that's we, quite right. We, uh, in the West, <clears throat> something doesn't make sense to a certain segment of people in the population who are going to disseminate the information mm -hmm. until it can be looked at in a certain kind of analytical, biomedical way. Th there is a propensity for showing clinical results until such time as underlying mechanisms are understood. Exactly, yes, yes, you can take me to the patient's bed bedside. Yes, you can show me that it works. But until I understand the molecular mechanisms mm -hmm. present and how they're working, I won't look at it. I'm so not really going I'm not, to believe this. I'm not, I'm not seeing this. I can't hear what you're saying. Right, right. So, yeah. which, is, um, which is, I suppose, uh, from a point of view of scientific methodology, interesting. But mm -hmm. from the point of view of the person who is in pain or mm -hmm. other, some other type of discomfort, it doesn't do anything whatsoever. Well, and it's, it's part of our cultural bias. I mean, each yeah. culture has its own kind of blinders on. It and does. that's one of our sets of blinders. It so. certainly does. Yes, it yeah. certainly does. Mm -hmm. And in addition, to, in addition to the use of physiotherapeutic measures and herbs, many of which are commonly available, mm -hmm. um, kitchen herbs, uh, some of which are not commonly available, mm -hmm. some of which are of, of uh, questionable legality or varying legality in this part of the world, um, there are other measures we can take. For example, the use of, uh, well, the wearing of certain gemstones and metals can act to attenuate the severity of pain. And in my impression, which uh, having been in India at one point and being sort of prescribed mm -hmm. a certain stone to mm -hmm. wear, mm -hmm. and my sort of, the, what I made of it, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. was that there was some sort of energetic um, relationship that was going on there that was wanting well, and that may be correct yes. or not i mean that was yes. what i made of it at the, the time. wearing of certain gemstones or certain metals mm -hmm. in contact with the surface of, of the body mm -hmm. in ayurvedic theory do elicit a certain electromagnetic and electrochemical mm -hmm. response to their wearing that mm -hmm. does alter or, or amend in some fashion the percentage of the, the perception of pain in mm -hmm. some instances mm -hmm. And to my Western thinking, that seems like a very, very subtle process. I mean, I don't deny it, but it seems like it would be a We, we usually refer to those modalities as Ayurveda subtle therapies. And oh, yes, it well, is. There you go. Yes, it yeah. is a subtle process. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. indeed. Yes, yes indeed. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so say some more about some of the other approaches. Uh, well, it's probably interesting to note that among the um, among the approaches utilized by Ayurveda is a modality called Marma Vidya. Now, Marma Vidya bears superficial resemblance to acupuncture. Hmm. Okay. However, instead of using needles to puncture the body, finger pressure is used in various locales on the body's surface or just inside its, just inside its orifices. 
And Marma Vidya comes into Ayurveda from outside. Hmm. It comes into Ayurveda from a South Indian martial art. That's interesting. Um, a very interesting martial art mm -hmm. called Kalari Payat. Kalari Payat is a form of fighting using a short sword and a small shield and hmm. um, uh, quite a bit of dancing about. But <laughs> the, the elaborators of Kalari Payat um, demonstrated that there exist on the surface of the body 100 and s actually 108 mm. vital points that when injured could subdue an opponent. And of course this is something that was taught to the warrior caste mm -hmm. in ancient mm -hmm. most India and um, an injured vital point would result in either the death or unconsciousness or paralysis mm -hmm. of an opponent. And these wouldn't necessarily correspond to any um, Western physiological vulnerable points. No, although about two thirds of the vital points coincide with the points uh, uh, postulated in the most widely practiced system of acupuncture. That's interesting. Uh -huh. About two thirds. There are some differences. Mm -hmm. Um, acupuncture points are tiny. Yes. Uh -huh. And you have to hit them head on. Mm -hmm. Marma points are much larger. So you can kind um, of go in on them. The largest right. Marma point is the width of your entire palm oh, okay. and encircles the right knee and the back of the knees. Uh -huh. It's huge. You can't mm -hmm. miss it. <laughs> um, but uh, it is, uh, it is uh, thought by some to be a, a, an ancestor modality of acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And as I say, there is a certain degree of conformity between the acupuncture points and the marma points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are 107, 108 on the surface mm -hmm. of the body that when stimulated with injurious intent can, can, can subdue an opponent, mm -hmm. but with stimulated with therapeutic intent can relieve a wide variety of conditions, preeminent among them pain. Mm -hmm. So, but not only pain, other things too then. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. exactly. Oh, interesting. Uh, in terms of foods, there are mm -hmm. certain foods that Ayurveda speculates can either uh, augment the intensity of pain or diminish it. Mm -hmm. And those, of course, would, would form a part of any Ayurvedic protocol where an individual client were dealing with a pain issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Amongst herbs, there are, again, the, the herb stock is large mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and a fairly controversial herb would mm -hmm. depend b because of its questionable legality in this country mm -hmm. as you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction is cannabis mm -hmm. or marijuana which uh, has a long standing tradition in pain control in Ayurveda and is uh, is quite effective not an entirely safe herb mm -hmm. there are there are long term costs attendant on its use mm -hmm. But for the control of severe pain, it's one of the more it's one of the most effective. It has real value. It has real value, yes. But not to be used carelessly. Certainly not yes. to be used recreationally. Yes. Uh -huh. um, it is um, ordinarily prescribed in the form of a milk decoction hmm. that is taken orally, uh -huh. um, as, as needed in Ayurveda, and uh, as needed, uh, and, and under the supervision of an Ayurvedic practitioner. Mm -hmm. Um, it is, I've never heard of it's being smoked, okay? Mm. So it's a very different result mm -hmm. when it's imbibed. Very effective at controlling pain uh -huh. of even the most intense variety. Um, but again, not an entirely safe substance. Mm -hmm. uh, in individuals who have used it over a period of, of time, mm -hmm. one does to see, one does tend to see a falling off of liver function. Mm -hmm. Not so intensely that anyone would call it hepatitis, but the mm -hmm. point is it's a falling off in liver efficiency that can continue over a very long because period Because using of it time. is taxing your liver. Oh, very yes, much so. Yes. Oh, very much so. Uh -huh. Very much well, so. Well, and, and uh, what I hear from all of this too is, in a way, the more powerful the substance in, for good also, the more potential there are for side effects and... Yes. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. And the story is told in Ayurveda of the author of Ayurveda's preeminent text of pharmacology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a sage named Bhavamishra, mm -hmm. 
who was assigned an examination by his teacher to go into the forest and bring him back a plant that had no medicinal value. Mm. And he was gone for months and finally dragged himself back to his teacher. He said, teacher, I could find no plant without medicinal value. Whereupon the teacher said, good, now go find me a plant that is absolutely non-toxic, <laughs> that it has absolutely <laughs> no poisonous qualities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Whereupon Bhava Mishra went into the forest, returning to his teacher months later, saying, teacher, I could find no plant that had never had any toxic uh, impact whatsoever, whereupon the teacher said, well, you passed the examination. There. You're a physician. <laughs> yeah. So everything is toxic, everything is therapeutic, depending only on the setting, the client, and the dosage. Well, I think this is a very good place to end this particular conversation. I, it's, um, it's kind of a holistic again. This mm -hmm. is a world of light and shadow. Indeed, And yes. we need to respect these things. So thank you so much for joining us, thank Bill. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pure pleasure. And I'm Paula Jamison. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.